Okay, so let me review um, some of the things that uh, we were talking about last time. Um, uh, one was the Wilson action. And for a gauge theory, it's a sum of the plaquette actions, summing over the plaquettes. And the plaquette action we took as some beta, 1 minus 1 over n. This is the dimension of the. Uh, of the group elements. Or the representation effectively. And then a real part of the trace and then uij, ujk, ukl, uli. Okay. And um, the idea was we had uh, i here J, K, L, and then back to I. And what you have is you have a group element on each of these links. Um, when you're doing this plaquette, this element is U, I, J, and that's what goes there. But if you're doing the plaquette under it, okay, on doing the plaquette under it, you would go like this. And so you would have the adjoint or the inverse of this link element. So down there, what you would have would be, so that's IJ. Let's just call this RS, too, so just to, so this is the upper plaquette. This lower plaquette would involve the trace of URS, USJ, and then UJI, UIR. Okay? It's the same rule as this, but the difference is that UJI is UIJ inverse or equivalently UIJ adjoint. Uh, that's because these elements uh, what we're talking about here is a uh, unitary representation of some group. And usually it's, for example, SU2, more complicated is SU3, but one can have even one can have simpler groups. For example, the group Z2 is just the elements plus or minus one. And that forms a group because one times one is one, one times minus one is minus one, minus one, minus one is one. So the thing is closed on the multiplication and multiplication is associated and so forth. One and minus one have inverses. Okay. So this is the Wilson loop, and um, if we then say that uij is e to the i, a bare coupling constant, g0, and then we'll call it, say, a1. And this a1, if we imagine this to be x, then this is x minus uh, e2 hat over 2. Well, minus a, the lattice spacing, times a vector in the two direction, but minus. In other words, if this is the point x and this is the lattice spacing, the, the, this plaquette is an a by a plaquette. A, 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 A in distance. Plaquette just means little square. 
why they use friendship. Anyway, if x is the center, then it's x. And if this is the one direction, and that's the two direction, then it's x minus a over 2, but in the two direction. Anyway, that's uij, and the result is that s for the upper plaquette is beta 1 minus 1 over n, real part trace, and then you have e to the i g0, a1 of x minus a over 2, uh, e2 hat. e2 hat is just a unit vector in the two direction. And then you have e to the i g0 a2, but now it's x plus a over 2 e1 hat because there's x, you go a over 2 in the one direction. Okay. Now you have e v i g a 0 a1 x um, plus a over 2 in the two direction. And then finally, e to the minus i g0 a2 of x minus a2 e1 hat. OK, so this is the plaquette formula. And I think it would be useful to have this as a homework problem um, expand uh, the exponentials. and uh, show that um, you get the right expression. The right expression being um, that this is, that S plaquette, S plaquette is then beta uh, G0 squared over 2n a to the fourth trace of F12 squared, where um, F12 is, well, it's E1, A2, and so forth. So this is 1 over A, um, D1 of A2. So this is A2 at X plus A over 2 e1 hat minus a2x minus a over 2 e1 hat. That's e1 and a2, yeah. Right. And then you have minus 1 over a, uh, a2 of a1, so this is a1 x plus a over 2 e2 hat minus a1 so that's that. But then you have the commutator. And the commutator is um, it's A1, A2, A2, A1, A2, and um, so you actually have to keep second order terms in A, right? Oh, there's no way there. Should there be A's in the exponentials? Little A's? Brilliant. <laughs> yes, because this is, it's not simply G0, A1, but it's A. Yeah. A, 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 absolutely. Yeah, that was out of my notes. All right, excuse me. Um, but you can't just expand the exponentials to first order. And yeah, I, the I, data, right? I think that's well. I think the funny know. thing is, uh, I mean, I would say, I mean, obviously, we're talking here a fourth. Um, so to be cautious, you'd expand this to second order. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there is no a one squared term in f in f one two squared. Oh, that's true. 
So, so those, so what you can do is you can, I mean, essentially you luck out. So if you want, you can skip that, or you can do it and show that they cancel. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually, I mean, I, I was actually thinking about that. Um, um, and it's, it's actually, at this point, it's not obvious to me how those cancel looking at this, because um, the second order term here is minus g0 squared a1 squared. And the second term here is also minus g0 squared a1 squared. So I don't know what's going to cancel that. Um, OK, so uh, what we have here then is, let us say, a1 of x minus a over 2 e2 hat plus a1 of x plus a over 2 Two does it does it need to cancel? I mean, we're all well. We're they, all either gonna, that or the trace has to go. Uh, uh, right. But I mean, we've already okay. So we're calling that inequality. It's not like we're saying that a. It, it's not like we're saying that s flat cat is actually plus some other terms, but they're just small because a gets a higher order, right? It actually equals that thing. Well, it's equal to that thing plus higher order terms. In A, right? In A. So maybe those A equal well, numbers, no, I guess there would be ones. Just A squared. I don't know. Actually, now that I think about it, um, for some reason, uh, he, he put the A inside the, um, I don't know, he scaled something by A here because he doesn't have the A explicitly. All right, anyway, um, what you then get here is uh, A2 of X. Uh, minus a over two e one net plus well a one half and then again a one half okay so it's essentially uh, this. Um, okay, so, uh, so the homework problem then is to expand this, and um, I think, and of course this A itself is not just an A1, it's, in other words, A1 is A1 I say T I, where T I is a generator. And this is an N by N matrix. And um, one uh, then you see what the what the trace value is. Um, you have to figure out what the trace. In other words, what the thing that you want to get is that S is effectively, um, eventually what you get is this. S is beta G0 squared over 2N integral a half trace and it's um, F mu nu squared D fourth X. That's effectively what's happening. Um, and um, d fourth x well is an eight of the fourth here. That's come that gives you d fourth x. And um, the one half comes from this thing gives you a one two 
doesn't give you two one. Oh, I see. So you get one two two one, and that's what the one. The integral is approximated by a sum over all the yes. boxes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So, um, as I said, the normalization that Kreutz used was a little bit different from the normalization. I, in other words, I I agree with you that one ought to put an a in here, and. Um, Anyway, I think that would be a reasonable homework mm -hmm. problem. Um, okay, so let's see. What's uh, and of course, what you want to do is you then choose. You have to decide what the trace is. Um, I think that what. Uh, what um, Kreutz decided was that uh, if these were n by n matrices, the trace would be n. I think that would, that's what he thought, and so that's how the thing cancels there. What eventually you want is that um, he picked uh, beta equal to uh, 2n over g0 squared. And if beta is 2n over g0 squared, then this thing is just uh, 1 half trace f mu nu squared d quad x, which, um, which is, uh, what you'd say as, what, what, what you'd say was the conventional classical action as long as as, as you um, suitably normalize the generators. Um, all right, so so much for that. Let me now switch to a topic that's a little bit mathematical, but that um, so probably appeals to some of you. Huh? Yeah? So what happens if you have other, like, non-gauge fields and, like, interaction terms and stuff? Oh, well, you what you do is you look for a lattice approximation for the interaction that you're dealing with. Now, in the case of fermions, this is not trivial. And um, I think it's probably safe to say that, that this still isn't really a good way of treating fermions. One way of treating them is to do the trick that we did in class, namely, fermionic action is quadratic in the fermionic fields. I guess I have to stand over here because I didn't move the camera. Anyway, the fermionic action is the is quadratic in the fermionic fields, and so you can do the Gaussian integral, you get a determinant. So the integral of a quadratic all in fermion fields is a determinant. The problem is it's a determinant in which the dimension of the determinant is the number of points in space-time, at least, okay. um, by square, of course, because it's it's an n by n matrix, where n is the number of points in space-time times the number of times, let's say, four Dirac components. But um, there might be several quark fields. This becomes absolutely gigantic. And that determinant, moreover, involves the gauge fields represented then as these two elements on the lattice. So it it's a it's it's don't ask is, is the short answer for the purposes of this course. I don't we're not going to try to do fermions. Um, but what 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 um, is amusing is that one didn't need to use a group as complicated as SU three. One can go to SU two. A lot simpler than that. <laughs> or ON, and you can even go to like Z2 yeah. or ZN. Yeah. In fact, I think maybe as a homework problem, might assign Z2. The thing that um, is interesting about Z2 is that, as let me, let me tell you what you can measure for Z2. You can measure the mean value of a plaque head. So what you're doing then is a you're doing effectively an integral um, 
e to the minus theta sum of all these, well, when I say plaquette, I mean the action of the plaquette. So, um, well, let's see, did he put it in, does he have the action of the plaquette or the actually the plaquette? So this is, and, and then the plaquette is basically just the trace of the Z2 elements going around. And, and those Z2 elements are actually real, because it's just plus or minus one. So you have that, and then you divide that by e to the minus theta sum of the plaquette actions. Okay, so if you do that, what you find is that the plaquette can have a maximum value of 1 and the minimum, well, I guess it could have a value of minus 1, mm -hmm. but um, the, I guess if you normalize it somehow, it turns out to be, um, I mean, there's some sign convention just that goes between 0 and 1. And what happens is you get these various points up here and you're plotting here beta, this parameter, and then at some point, wang, it goes all the way down there. So there's a, this is called a strong, a first order, order phase transition. Um, so it might be nice to, to, to do a Monte Carlo, um, so the question is, what what would you do it on? Do you guys both have computers that you can program in Fortran or C or something? Yeah, <laughs> not Fortran. <laughs> I could use a variety of languages. What languages? Well, I could use C or C++ or Python. Or okay. Do it in MATLAB or something. Yeah, C or C++ actually. I mean, it depends on, on, it, on it depends on, it's not, but it depends on how big the, the lattice is. Right. I mean, if it's like... Well, let's put it this way. 10 to the 60, then. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> yeah, it should be C++. Um, I think one can exhibit this with... Um, Is this the Euclidean uh, action? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, the, the, the thing that Kreutz published, this was back in 1980 when computers were slower, this was a 5 to the dwarf lattice. I'll do that. Um, what, what would be interesting is if somebody has particularly fast computer and then somebody else could do 10 to the 4 and see whether this I don't know if one can see any renormalization group effects in this particular problem it may be too simple for that. Roy Kreutz doesn't mention it here but it uh, alright so I was thinking that that could be a also a sort of homework project, or maybe an extra credit homework problem. Let's do it that way. Since is it, let, what I should do is I should be a little bit more specific. Let me in fact give you a reference. Mm -hmm. This is um, Michael is the first name here. Freud's and it's um, FizRev D21 number 4 1980 page 10,000 
six. And um, in in this particular case, there's no point in doing the trace. The thing is one by one, so it's one minus the real part of just it's one minus the real one minus the real part of just this product. But it's going to be real. Huh? It's going to be real. Duh, yes. Um, in, in, uh, he was doing Zn. Uh, okay. Well, but okay, the Z2, yeah. you're right, it's, it is real. So Zn and the representations are yeah, yeah. So, so, in other words, just to make things uh, simple here, um, S plaque pad here is 1 minus uh, Uij, Ujk, Ukl, Uli, and in fact, you don't even need to distinguish between uh, between whether whether well more well, because more than that they're more, self inverse more than that the inverse is, yeah. is the group element that is to say one inverse is one minus one inverse is minus one so um, why not do such a simulation okay anyway let me get back to this mathematical issue. Um, Mm, that's that's why it's zero and one, because they're using z two as being generated by zero and one with modular two arithmetic. Right, but um, oh, that's right. Yeah, what what this must be is this is s plaquet. This is not the plaquet. This is s plaquet. Mm -hmm. Because um, this thing well, here, yeah. this thing here can be minus one as one as one. Even if it is the plaquette, you just instead of choosing one and minus one. But that's what they choose. It really is one. Although well, maybe it's not unitary. It's not a unitary representation. Yeah. No, th this is. I'm saying if you, use, if you use zero and one, like you would Well, yeah. If you use yeah. zero and one, then there would be no problem. But it's really minus one. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I think he was doing here S plaquette. He just. He wrote P, and I think that's what he must mean. Okay, anyway, let's um, suppose we have an arbitrary group with elements G, um, and we might have some function, excuse me, of the group elements, and we might want to integrate the function over the group, okay? This group integration. And um, why is this relevant here? Well, it's relevant here because we're, in general, putting a group element on each link of the lattice. And we're integrating, in principle, over the whole group for every link of the lattice. But we're going to want to follow it. OK. Now, what one wants is, um, is one wants this to be the following, that the same as g prime g dg. In other words, if you do a shift where g prime is an arbitrary element in g, and we're integrating over the whole group, so would this be the same on all like cosets generated by g right cosets? I guess. You 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 could think of it that way. I I think you could think of it that way. But what I want to say is, if this is true, then dg is a left invariant measure. Are we going to choose a particular measure? For yeah. We're going to compute what the measure is. We're going to get a formula for, in, for measures. Is it the hard measure? It, it, yeah, it must be. Um, now, uh, suppose A are the parameters of the group, which is to say A1, A2, AN are the parameters of the group. What are the parameters of the group? The labels. Like these are the elements? No, all right. No, no, go ahead. Good, good, good question. SU2, for example. You can write SU2 as e to the i 
theta dot sigma over 2. Mm -hmm. okay. And so theta can be the parameters. That's the idea. Um, and so this, this measure here, integral f of g dg, well, this is going to be f of g of a. That's how we're, a, is, a labels the group element. And then a measure, m of a, and then dn a. Not to be confused with the genome. Uh, what That's a joke. <laughs> DNA. What's, what's M of A? M of A is the measure. Oh. I wrote it here as just DG, but now I'm getting serious and I'm going to try to compute it. All right. Any questions? Uh, I guess I'm lost. <laughs> Huh? Uh, I guess I'm I, I guess I'm just lost about the math. Okay, well ask a ask a question and and I'll try to uh, fill it in because if you're missing something, I can tell you it's simple. So what is it that you're missing? What is it that we're integrating over the group? In fact, let me make it a little more concrete. This group, if we write it down, um, what does it look like? This is cosine of theta over 2 plus i theta dot sigma sine theta over 2. Okay? There's the, the group identity is next to the cosine, <laughs> if you want to be. Um, it's the n by n identity, right? This is a two by two. So two by two. Yes. All right. Does it make you feel better to have that in there? I always just thought I'd suppress it. I mean, I'm used, to, I'm used to seeing it there, so I guess it does. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm writing a book, so maybe I can put it in there. Right anyway, okay. So for example, this group SU two. One way of thinking of it is that a group element G of A is a0 plus i a dot sigma, where a0 squared plus a vector squared is equal to 1. Okay. Where a0 is cosine theta over 2, and the a's are theta i sine theta over 2, and um, this, oh, hey, 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 that's theta hat. That's theta hat, I left theta hat. Right. So uh, this is the rule. Now, that means then that we can think of this group element, this SU2 element, as a function not of, we can either think of it as for a function of if we think of it as labeled by a0 through a4, or a0 through a3, then what is it? It's, this is the surface of a unit sphere in four dimensions. This is called the, S, this is called the sphere S3. Mm -hmm. So the SU2 group can be parameterized by points on a unit sphere in four dimensions. Surface of the well, that's what the sphere is, it's the surface. Duh. And um, uh, alternatively, we can say that it is square root of 1 minus a vector squared plus i a dot sigma. So those are two different ways of writing this you two. So what I'm saying is we can think of the group manifold as this, if we're SU2, as a surface, of, as a sphere in three dimensions, or the surface of a sphere, I'm sorry, in four dimensions, unit sphere, um, or we can think of it as this structure here, parameterized by three numbers, these, the three numbers, the three vector A, because we've written A0, we've used this constraint to write A0. Um, and 
actually, now that I think about it, um, I would only get half the sphere, so I suppose I should write plus or minus there. Because I'd only get half the sphere otherwise. Yes. In any event, um, so the question is, how do we get a, a left invariant measure? The left invariant measure means that when you integrate over the group, it's, it's the same whether you have a G prime here or not, no matter what G prime is. And so what we want is we're going to say that uh, the parameters of the group then are the A's, and um, the integral over the group is then this measure, F of G labeled by A, M of A, DNA. Enjoy the fun every time I say that. <laughs> um, okay, let's look at the group multiplication law. G of A of C and B. This is G of C times G of B. So, in other words, A, B, and C are n vectors that label group elements. So the group multiplication law is G of C times G of B is G of A, but the parameters A depend upon C and B. Okay. And we're going to use this to figure out what M has to be in order to make it left invariant. As you say, the R measure. Remind me again of why we wanted it to be left invariant? Oh, it could be right invariant. In fact, once, why it's, left, once it's left invariant, it'll be right invariant. Why do we want it to be invariant at all? Brilliant question. Um, the deal is, if it's invariant, then there are no bumps. Okay. That is to say, in the function? No, the function can have bumps, but no bumps in the measure. In other words, um, oh, okay, because I'm still integrating over all g. Right, you're integrating over all of G, but if this G, yeah, yeah. This if this G were, all right, let's do an example. Let's do Z2 as an example, okay? Or, or as a better example, let's just do U1. U1, the group manifold is just the unit circle. Now, suppose D of G were really sick, okay? All right, what's a sick measure? A sick measure would be that it's um, like that. It give, it's one for these angles and zero over there. Okay, now you've got some uh, function here. And now let's take the function to be, let, let, let's say the function is that it's one on angles between here and here, okay? Then the integral of f of g dg would be whatever the length of that thing is, which is duh, it's, uh, it's pi, isn't it? Because um, pi d would be the whole thing. It's 2 pi divided by 2. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, I'll give you a now. Now, so now, now let's see how this breaks down. Multiply by the group element e to the i pi. So e to the i pi g dg. Now we're just over here. And this thing gives zero. All right. So in other words, if the thing is left invariant, then the measure has no bumps, basically. Okay. All right. So now, any, any, any questions? By the way, you came in late. I, I think it's a homework problem. You ought to uh, expand this thing. And uh, don't do it the way I did it in class, namely trying to do it in the exponents. Expand these guys to, um, you actually only need one term, two terms, but, um, but 
In fact, it would be nice if somebody did it with three terms to keep the quadratic term to see why it canceled. I, mean, I find it a little bit puzzling as to why it would cancel. Or why it cancels. Okay. Um, all right, so now let's let's use this rule. So what do we have? We have f of g of b, m of b, dn b is integral f of g of c, g of b, m of b. D and B. This is what it means to be left invariant, where G prime is G of C. On the other hand, the multiplication rule tells us that this is equal to the integral of F of G of A of C and B. M of B D and B. Now, now what we're going to do is we're going to change variables. We're going to say dnb is equal to the determinant of the partial of b with respect to a. Okay, the Jacobian, in other words. For SU2, this would be a 3 by 3 matrix. In fact, that's going to be a homework problem. I did it last night, actually. Got it wrong. I got it wrong two or three times and finally got it right. It only takes minutes, actually. Um, DNA. So I'm back to my pun. Um, okay, so that's what that is. And. So what does this equation look like then? It's um, integral f of g of b, m of b, d and b is integral f of g of a. We're switching now to a. Determinant of partial b, partial a. M of B DNA. And now over here, I'm just going to replace B with A. And so this is the same thing as integral F of G of A, M of A, DNA. And I'm back to my pun. Okay. Now we compare the two sides of this equation and we see that M of A has to equal determinant of partial B partial A times M of B. So this is the rule that follows from the group multiplication law and the requirement of left invariance. Okay. And a little bit more explicitly, what does this say? This says that M of A of C and B is M of B divided by determinant of partial A of C and B with respect to B. All right, now, we can make this a lot simpler <coughs> by setting B to E, such that G of E is the identity. Okay? And, um, and in fact, I'm then going to say that M of E is just 1. So I'm using actually what I what I think is, not, uh, let me ask you guys, what do you like as a notation? I would say let B go to zero. So G of zero 
is the identity E. Yeah, I like that. You like that better? Yeah. So M of zero is E the identity. So so E, e, e and it's true. Is that one of the traditions? Yeah. E is one in a in group speak. It's the it's the identity. Okay, good. Uh, That's what I remember. So M of B is a is a group element value thing. No, no, no. M of B is the measure. M is the measure. So M of zero is one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. That's right. Duh. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just defining it to be one. It's, it's, in general, yeah. it's whatever the normalization requires. But to make things simple, I'm setting it to be one. So it's, that means that M of A of C and B at uh, B equal to zero is one over determinant of partial of A of C B partial B B equals zero. Okay, that's the idea. Now let me. Um, I, I I want you guys to work this out for SU two, but um, in order to give you some help, um, I'm alone. I don't. Whoops! I have the right notes. So these these two measures are related only by a. So why are we why are we imposing the condition that they're related by a rescaling and not by a uh, I don't know an isometry which would be more general. Which where where, 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 where why are these the two measures are related by this rescaling right What's the what's the this was what makes them invariant makes the measure invariant. But or left invariant. So we're, we, this is the formula for a Lahar measure, if you will. But I mean, the, the derivation is here, right? You want left invariance. You use the group multiplication law, and then you go through this. Which, by the way, I've, I've just put in my book, okay? I just added a section on on group integration. Um, and I'm essentially following Kreutz's discussion of this. Anyway. So how, is this, does it get crazy for uh, discrete groups? Well, it would just be a For discrete groups, it's, it's essentially trivial. You mean like Z2? Yeah, well, well it sounds you, weigh, you weight one and minus one equally. Okay. I mean, it's just a sum. It's no longer a right? Okay. Yeah. Have to integrate over. There's probably some optimization. Okay, now let's okay. let me get you guys started figuring this out, okay? Press you. First of all, let's let's use the nice representation. I mean there are different ways of, of labeling the group. Um, one way is to say it's the surface of a unit sphere in four dimensions, or it's the unit sphere in four dimensions. And um, then your integration is d fourth a delta of what should I say? Is it one minus a squared? Uh, all right, let's just say one minus a squared, oh, where. Insane. A squared is a zero squared plus just a one squared plus a three squared. Okay. Now, on the other hand, the, 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 it's, I think, stupid to keep four variables when you can get away with three. Um, although, as I say, we do, we've got that, that plus or minus there, which is kind of, um, I mean, you'll get you'll get the same thing once you use up the delta function, right? Right, 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 right. The, the, because what you can do is you can say this is integral d q day times d a zero, and this is delta of one minus a vector squared minus a zero squared, and so then this is d q day over two a zero. Um, 
or absolute value of 2a0, but it occurs twice because it can be plus or minus, so it's 2 over that. And um, uh, so then we're just integrating d cubed a, and now we're integrating d cubed a then, uh, so this, this is an integral d cubed a over uh, square root of 1 minus a vector squared. So when we get down to three parameters, uh, that's what we have. And um, so that's the measure there. And uh, after all, that does completely label the group because we know from this description of SU2, there is only, are only really three parameters. And so this is, but what's not obvious, I mean, if you were just doing, if you didn't know about the surface of the sphere in four dimensions and so forth, and you just said, well, there are these three parameters theta, you might say, well, I'm going to integrate over the sphere uh, out to some distance and um, uniformly would be the natural thing to do. And you see, you're not supposed to do it uniformly, you're supposed to do it this way, which emphasizes the surface of this. So you're integrating now over a unit sphere in, th a unit ball or sphere in three dimensions, but you're really emphasizing the surface. In fact, I'm a little worried that that diverges. Um, um, let's let's just put in spherical coordinates. It's four pi integral r squared dr over the square root of one minus r squared. Um, and we're integrating zero to one. I'm just doing the volume now, and um, I guess this is all right. This is convergent. Is it really the points in a unit ball in one dimension less, or I guess so? If we went from the if we went from S three, well, what are you saying? It's like the points in B B two or something. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm completely baffled as to what the question is. So you said we could, I mean, one way to think of the group is the points in S3. Right, unit sphere in four dimensions. And so now you're saying integrating over all those points is the same as integrating over some unit ball. Right. And the, the, re the reason is that you can, you can label every element of the group by a three vector. And um, the thing must converge. Uh, let me just, shall I use Wolfram Alpha to find out what that integral is? Does somebody want to do it um, while I'm doing something else? <laughs> I know, the, the person who should do it, here. There, just X out that and say integrate R square, uh, x squared dx over square root of 1 minus x squared and see what it gives you. Sorry, I, I was... From 0 to 1. I don't understand. <laughs> what? And then we use that before. All right. See, I, I say here, integrate, the there's the integrand, it's okay, more complicated, sure. from 0 to x. Mm -hmm. Well, now integrate uh, in fact, you can just say integrate r squared dr over square root of 1 minus r squared from 0 to r. And you just have to, <laughs> it, when, you, when you hit that with your finger, you get a keyboard. All right, so you work that out, and I, I think it will turn out convergent. All right, so let's figure out how this works, um, what this determinant is. And for that, we need to figure out square root of 1 minus b squared, whoops, 1 minus c squared, plus i sigma dot c, 
square root 1 minus b squared plus i sigma dot b is equal to square root of 1 minus a squared plus i a dot sigma. So this is, this is the group multiplication law. And we're going to be looking at this. This gives us a of c and b. And we're going to take, uh, we're going to find out, we're going to compute the partial derivative of A with respect to B uh, at uh, B equals zero. Okay, so basically what this tells us then is that I A dot sigma is um, this product of these two things. Why don't I say chalk by sub by just doing this? One minus a squared. And now a i then is minus i over two trace of i a dot sigma times sigma i. That's because the trace of sigma i sigma j is two delta i j. So this is then um, minus i over 2, trace, and then big structure here. Uh, well, just multiply it out, basically. What you get is um, i square root 1 minus c squared b dot sigma plus i square root 1 minus b squared c dot sigma minus c dot sigma, b dot sigma, and there's actually a bracket here, times sigma i, in which I've dropped terms that are clearly um, zero. In other words, the trace of sigma i times this square root is zero because the sigmas are all traceless. These are the power matrices. By the way, if your fingers are cold, it doesn't work. All right. I need to warm them while I wind up touching myself. Uh, <laughs> in, order, in order to keep my fingers warm enough to work the iPad. Okay, well, the, 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 the homework problem is finish this and show that, uh, in other words, compute partial AI partial bj, this is some uh, matrix, and then uh, take the, this is some matrix, um, and then you take the determinant of it, and this at, at b, equals zero, b equals zero, and this gives you the, the measure, m of a, and what I want you to do is to show that this is one over square root of one minus a vector squared. So, that would be. Do you, you say that was basically the Jacobian on the bottom? Yes. With, a, with kind of a factor of A instead of. Well, a, 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 is a, a is a three vector here. Right. And but C I mean, and B are three vectors. So it's the derivative of the three vector A with respect to the three vector B. Yeah. All right. Take a swig of water here. All right, now. Um, here, I. Okay, not even on the All right. All right. Um, so now let, now let me. Um, uh, explain the metropolis step, which you guys may have, may all know, but let me, um, let me say what the purpose of it is, first of all. Basically, you want to, you imagine that x, all right, x is some label 
that labels a uh, a configuration. What kind of a configuration? It could be the value of uh, what's on all the links of the lattice. That's one possibility for x. Another possibility of x is it's the location of all the atoms in a protein that you're trying to fold, trying to find its state of minimum free energy. Or, uh, God, whatever else uh, you might want. I mean, it's extremely general. And so what you want to generate is a sequence of configurations that are distributed according to a certain uh, probability. And to start with uh, the problem where we want is the probability is going to be e to the minus e of x over kt, or e to the minus beta e of x. So x so labels the configure. Huh? And the answer is. If, if you include the 4 pi, that whole integral is pi squared. Good. It's pi over 4. Uh, just as long as it's finite. Is yeah, what it's not uh, sure. Uh, it is manifestly finite. Physics is saved, along with mathematics. All right, so this is what we want. We want to generate a sequence of configurations that are distributed according to this probability distribution. In other words, if we look at these, we've got, say, a million configurations. Uh, and we evaluated the energy of each configuration, and what we find out was that the probability of each one occurring was e to the minus beta e of x, where beta is 1 over kt. So this is the most common use of it. And um, what you do is the following. You uh, start with some random configuration. And uh, let us say uh, x. And then you consider another configuration x prime. And the question is, do you move from x to x prime or not? Okay. Well, if e of x prime is less than e of x, uh, you accept the move. Move. This is getting worse. Delta x equals x prime minus x. Okay. If e of x prime is greater than e of x, you accept with probability e to the minus, and let me get the formula right, e prime minus e over kt, but let me just call that beta. So in other words, e prime is greater than e, so this is positive, e to the minus beta is less than 1. So this is a negative, this is a probability that's less than 1. And in fact, if E prime is much bigger than E, this thing is essentially Zippo, unless the temperature is very, very high. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the Metropolis rule. And um, what you do in order to implement this, the top part is obvious, you just, you have this, you pick a random configuration x prime. If that energy is less, you move to x prime. On the other hand, if it's bigger, what you do is you generate a random number. And if the random number is less than e to the minus e prime minus e times beta, then you accept. All right. It's completely random, or is it? What is the distance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy is random. R is pseudo-random on zero, zero, one. zero, one. In fact, it's open. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and, and, and if you, you want to see this as a, as a, uh, as a in, in computer language, or let's say in Fortran 90 language, if, um, If nu e 
less clear equal to OB then Careful, you're going to go off the punch card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 hear a, I, I hear quite a bit of criticism. I'm going to get that clip off the video. X plus X out plus DX. Else, uh, I've got a thing where call random number of R, so that gets you the random number R, and let me. Anyway, so you say um, if. R less than or equal to EXP minus, well, beta times nu E minus old E. I ran off the punch card. <laughs> uh, then, and then uh, accept, and then you say XI is XI plus uh, DX. Uh, end if. And in fact, there are two ends if. Alright, so this is the way it looks in Fortran 90. Um, in C, it would look um, it would be more compact and somewhat more mysterious. Um, harder to read, um, but anyway. Okay, we're all happy. Um, now, the question is why does this work? Um, and, and oh, in fact, let me just say something. Typically, you don't go, you don't take the whole configuration and change it to another whole configuration. What you typically have, especially in lattice gauge theory, is you have uh, what, what you do is you have a particular link, and you change, you make a change of the value of whatever x is on the ith link. And so that's the. So can you you can only hop to nearest uh, points right now. You mean well? I mean the for, the the for computational the simplicity, what you normally do is you sweep through the lattice in a regular way, updating each link sequentially, and um, in each case, what you do is you. Um, there's your link value. You then there's, there's some group element on this link. You then pick an arbitrary group element, and you and here's where this invariant measure comes in. You've got to pick that in such a way that you 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 you're integrating in an invariant. You don't want any bumps, so you has to, you have to use this measure. And um, I worked out the one for so two. This is that's different. a measure that's kind of uniform over all the oh, the, oh the group yeah. But what if you somehow what if, so if you if you made that I don't know if this makes sense but like uh, to to where it was a, a measure that weighted things uh, if, let's say you're doing you're, you're trying to find some something in like a in a physical space so the where locations the the distance corresponds to a, a physical distance right and you're weighting what distance you're talking about x is a distance. I guess x is a location. I mean, in general, this x is going to be like the phase space. So it will include positions and right. momenta or the classical type of setting. Or, and in lattice gauge theory, x is the particular group element on each link for all links of right. lattice. So is it, I guess, is it guaranteed to not work as well if you if you don't use uh, a hard random measure, like I, I, I think it would be extremely dangerous not to use an invariant measure, right? which is just a uniform measure. Right? Right. It's just a measure without bumps. But what uh, if you know something about it, right? Huh? You, like you know something even more about the distribution, than, and you've kind of worked in. All right, let, let, let me let me let me let me let me back. Off. Okay. Let me let me stop a second and mention something. Here, I'm taking the probability distribution to be this standard uh, 
e to the minus beta h, essentially, okay. which is the thing that's used almost universally. However, and in fact, I, um, in the next class, I'll explain that you can do a metropolis algorithm for an arbitrary probability distribution. It doesn't have to be this. And I'll show how to do that. And um, that's called a smart monkey or it's a more general Monte Carlo. No, it's a, it's a more general Monte Carlo, and then there's also a smart Monte Carlo. So I'll show how to do those two. Um, where we kind of run out of time, and I forgot to say something. One of the reasons why I was careful to assign, I guess, these three homework problems. Oh, the one I'll call an extra credit problem. Doing Z2, I'll say, is an extra credit problem. Um, although I, and it's that I'm going to be away next week at a conference on biophysics, and so. Oh no, it's not spring break yet. No. It's the week after. So I'm going to miss all of next week, which is cla a class week. So you have two free days, Monday, Wednesday, and then we have spring break. So you have a lot of time to do the homework. <laughs> and um, uh, doing, doing that should be, well, I don't know, it depends on how fast you work, how much experience you have, but that and that should be an hour each, but the extra credit thing, I mean, that could be a whole weekend, I mean, depending on how much experience you have writing programs. Um, anyway, the Monte Carlo is described here in the notes, and um, the, these online notes, this book I'm writing, I, but I, I do you want me to explain why the Monte Carlo works, or shall I just let that go until next? Do it until I get back. I, mean, I sort of have a vague notion of these metropolis algorithms already, so I kind of. So I you want me to do it now, or I'll do it when so I get back? I think you can wait for me to get back. Okay. Let me just mention one thing, though. The key. For, let me let me just say something that's really key. You have to make. Sh remember, I said if you have x. In fact, let us, to be specific, you, let's say i is the ith link, okay? So I said you pick, you pick a random, you make a random change on, say, that ith link. Okay? You make a random change on the ith link. What's really important is that the the probability that you will pick, just to test, not that you will accept, but the probability you will pick that random change has to be the same as if you had x prime on that link, the probability that you pick x to test. Is this like a detailed balance? Yes. Yeah. So that, that is absolutely key. You've got to have that. Now it turns out in smart Monte Carlo you change this in order to make it work faster. But for now, I mean, wouldn't you usually just have a flat distribution of I'm going to change this group element to this other one with? In fact, one way of getting detailed balance is, is to use the invariant measure, because if you've got one link, instead of picking another, you just pick something that's random on the surface of the sphere. Um, actually, now that I think about it, picking a random element might be a little too much because that that means you you could make a huge change. Sometimes you want to make the change. In other words, there's a certain amount of art to this thing. You you want to make changes delta x such that you don't want them too small, or the thing is going to move through the configuration space too slowly. But if you make it too big, all the changes are going to, are going to be, almost all the changes are going to be rejected. And then you're also going to move too slowly. So this is sort of an optimum. The optimum is kind of having half of the changes accepted. Something like that. Might be root, one over root two or something, but it's, 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 you know, medio tutissimus ease, which is 
you go most safely in the middle. It's either Daedalus said it to Icarus or Icarus said it to Daedalus. But whoever was whoever didn't say it wasn't listening. <laughs> Alright, so you might as well stop it. <laughs>